Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, interesting as usual and, and, uh, and, and deep as usual. Um, I want to have a few comments of my own. Now we have two wrestlers. I think you're very happy with the match. Hey, Benny, you're happy with the match? You asked for challenge, you got your challenge. And I'll, and I'll give you a few more, okay? Um, uh, I agree with the two commentators. I want to add uh, um, a few points, okay? Uh, let me start with the agriculture part, okay? Uh, nobody talks today about agriculture by itself or even manufacturing by itself. There's a value chain approach, okay? You have the plantation, you have the processing of the plantation, you have services that are related to them. The fact that it's difficult to move things between the African countries does not mean that we focus on agriculture alone, but it also means that we fix those, those problems, okay? IT is a tool that should be used in order to improve uh, agriculture and, and manufacturing. So I think it's a whole, it's a whole, uh, it's a whole process there. Um, um, you mentioned that 90% of what's happening in Africa is all informal sector, okay? And this defeats gravity, and this is very true. Okay? And my, most of my, the rest of my comments are going to be about how to get out of this. What are the solutions? Okay, so it defeats gravity. What can we do about it? What do you see from the 35 countries that you've visited, from all your work? What can be done there? Uh, another, the same point goes to the people who do not go back. Okay? Because even though it's not a huge phenomenon, the migration of, the, uh, of, of people from one country to the other, and it is true, by the way, and it is confirmed that that Africans are not actually the key migrants and they migrate within Africa. But you do see a lot of these models. You see the Nigerian, the Kenyans studying and then staying outside and not returning back. Of course, this is an individual decision, but it's also a state problem that they do not uh, know how to attract them to go back. So again, what can be uh, uh, suggesting that? What can be suggested? I like very much who's helping who, because it is very true. Who's helping who? Uh, about the complexity of Africa. Africa is definitely really complex, but the way we are addressing its solutions, even internationally, are not complex. And the simplest example is that there is big, big, big talk and big propaganda about the trade agreement, the free trade agreement. But you are talking about the free trade agreement in a continent that's terribly different within itself. There are areas that are extremely poor, there are areas that are more advanced. Who's going to trade with who and trade what? So there are preconditions, okay? And the preconditions are in setting certain minimums. There is no energy. 70% of Africa has no light. 70% of the Africans do not have access to the technology. There are serious transportation issues. 20 kilometers between two, two uh, one of the one interlocked countries, okay? And, and it would take days to go because there are no decent roads. So there are definitely preconditions for trade agreements. Why isn't the African Development Bank doing something about that, uh, encouraging everybody to do the preconditions, to take the basics first, before jumping to economic solutions that are really not fit for this continent in its present state? Um, one more point is also related to uh, uh, International organizations, the international organizations are setting policies, they are stopping the exports from Africa, they are stopping a lot of things. And they are being messed up themselves because of crazy people like Trump and so on and so on and everything, the, 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 the chaos that's happening, okay? And then the fight with China is messing up the international community altogether. Isn't it time, isn't it time that organizations like the World Trade Organization and like the World Bank Okay. And like the IMF, start to have leadership from developing countries who know the problems. Because at this point, this is not happening. And the international system seems to be shaking and, and messed up and no replacement. Isn't it time that this happens? Okay. So it's a question that I'm raising. Um, my, my last point is related to the poverty line. You mentioned uh, that $1.9 dollars as a poverty line is too high. I, I thought this was a typo. It's not a typo. It's a, you think it's too high. Uh, w are we talking about $1.9 a day as a number? Or are we talking about its, its PPP, purchasing power value? 
because the whole I, this is setting the poverty line the very minimum for people to reach. If all of Africa cannot reach that, then we have all of Africa under the poverty line. Mm -hmm. Or are we talking about $1.9, the equivalent of $1.9 in purchasing uh, 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 purchasing parity. This is important because the poverty line for me is nothing to be happy about at all. We, our most recent uh, survey in Egypt showed that 32% of our population is living under the poverty line. This is disastrous because for me the poverty line, the real poverty line is higher than that. Poverty line, we're talking people who can hardly live their day, can hardly find food to survive. But we are talking about education and health access and a lot of things. So the poverty is actually way higher in Egypt and it is way higher in Africa. But I'm wondering if calculations have been made for the PPP, for the 1.9, I don't know. And then last, uh, very last point, I'm sorry I took for too long. Um, even if Africa is not the big sender of migrants to Europe, even migration within Africa is something that we have to look at very carefully because it simply means it shows right away where the magnet is, where the areas that are more developed are, and this means that we need a lot more homogeneous development within the, within the continent. I will stop here, and uh, um, before I, I give you a chance to comment, I'm going to open the floor for a few questions. This way you get to, uh, so are there any questions on the floor? Okay, and, okay, please. Uh, but please, I mean, no more than one minute interventions, please. Thank, thank you. My name is Mohamed I would like just, you, you, uh, your presentation was very, uh, very smart, but uh, agriculture and industrialization uh, are made in a context, it's a political context, and you cannot, uh, because as you said, all people, every people talking about Africa, they, they went, didn't go to Africa. I, I lived there for long, I, wo I worked in one of the poorest countries, and I realized that uh, famine and poverty is uh, done on purpose because uh, there is a lot of political systems who are, uh, who are supported by the West because they think that authoritarian makes stability and they will pay a very big price for this. So there is a con political context, there is a good governance and this is not, it should be addressed, you know, because and uh, for the for the north is watching he's not watching the famine he is uh, taking advantage out of it uh, about dr ibrahim what you said about the, the statistics of 2015 2015 uh, most immigrants came from turkey and they stopped after they make a deal of six billion uh, dollars you know in two installment and uh, after this you know the italian they make a deal with the local mafia in libya and they stop the immigrant. The problem is that the people, there is two seasons for immigration. In summer, in, in winter, they come from Africa to Libya because too, it is too hot in summer. And in summer, they go to Italy. So now there is about 800,000 African. And African didn't stop to come to Libya. And it will reach one moment, it will explode. And nobody is ready for this. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. It was really great. I hope that we will be able to have the, um, the slides. My name is Dora Fiani, and I chair um, NGO by the name of Knowledge Economy Foundation. We are totally specialized in small farmers development using digital agriculture, and I would like to talk to you about your organization later. But I would like to give a piece of information and a comment. The piece of information is that we will have in Cairo, end of October this year, the Africa Food Day, organized by the African Union together with Egypt, uh, on the basis that Egypt has the presidency of the African Union this year. And uh, I believe, I hope that you will be here. There is a technical session, a full day technical session before the commemoration day and I believe very important that we find a slot for you to intervene. And if you allow me, I will mention this. The second point is that I'm involved in this Africa Food Day preparation because I'm part of a European African consortium of 35 entities, 
half European, half African, involved in uh, implementing a, Euro a European Union funded program to support cooperation between European Union and African Union in the area of agriculture and agriculture research to develop programs which will correspond to the uh, needs of the countries. So there again, there is a very important component and there is a European Union task force document prepared to that effect. And I need the last, the comment is that what you said about youth and the challenge of the fact that the land is owned by the fathers who are 60 years old is a key issue. We are involved in a program right now <coughs> related to this. And that is a topic which really, because it's at the core of agriculture. How will you make agriculture sexy and cool Thank for youth you. to Thank go you, into Fran. agriculture? Fran is a great uh, consultant. Who, any other comments? At the back, at the back first. Okay. Hello, my name is um, Sumto. I'm from the African Development Bank. I'd like to begin by thanking um, Professor Benny for a wonderful um, lecture. I'd like to start with um, what you said, um, the solutions preferred by members of the panel about agricultural um, industrialization, land reform being solutions to the problem. But I'll, I also noticed that you failed to um, make mention of um, uh, the political side to it, because I believe without uh, a reform in the political system, without a change with, uh, to the problems that currently um, the political uh, side the system are facing, like corruption, um, tribalism, ethnic, ethnic consideration, I believe if what are the solutions you prefer to this political um, system, because it's my own belief that without, uh, without a change, without any meaningful change on the political front, we can't make any meaningful gain on the economic front. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last question here. Okay. I would like to comment uh, on, the, on Dr. Abla, she said, about 70% of the people uh, without uh, light in the villages, whether in, in Africa or in Egypt. Uh, uh, yeah, in Africa. So <clears throat> I have solution regarding in using the intelligent uh, village. Intelligent village, I think, by using the solar systems, replacing the fossil uh, fuel, and <coughs> uh, <coughs> the solar system will, uh, will generate electricity. And by generating <coughs> electricity, we can communicate through IoT, int uh, internet on uh, things. And by using internet of things, we can educate the student in, uh, at home online system. So this will solve plenty of thank problems. Thank you very much. If you have something written about it, we, I think, would be happy to share it with the African Development Bank and with yeah. everybody. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Thank you. Okay, it's time for you to comment on thank that. Thank you economy. for making the point. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for making the point about why the numbers have gone down. And you, uh, Dr. Awad, when you quoted three, the number of deaths has gone down, 3,700. You know, no one has any idea, and I've read the report of the International Commission on Migration, which has now become a part of the UN system, that there is no idea whatsoever of the number of people who have died in trying to cross the Sahara. The figure that you have mentioned is people who have drowned in the Med, and it's an estimate. The, the rest, you're absolutely right. And can I say that you're, you, again, I was very privileged to have been taught by a famous Indian economist called Amartya Sen. Amar, some of you are nodding, you know him. My work, all my work in the last few years has been based exactly on his theory. And it is very simple this. Famines arise not because there is lack of food, 
but because people are denied access to food. And this is what's happening now in Africa. Amartya Sen was a small child. He's a few years older than me. He was a small child at the time of the Bengal famine in 1943, when there were plenty of warehouses full of food guarded by British soldiers and local Indian people were dying of starvation on the outside. Now this is, there is no equivalent that I know now, but in the Ethiopian famine of 85, and I was there, I was working in Ethiopia, that is exactly what was happening. If you were a member of the army, of the police, of the party in power, yes, you got vouchers with access to food. So I come back to all the things that have been said, including your point, and I'll be delighted to hear more of, you, of your work. Where has anybody in the audience said, yes, let us, let us have some land reform, let us allocate the farmers the right to own their own land. That will be one of the issues the gentleman from the African Development Bank is questioning. If there was more certainty of land, there would be fewer clashes in various parts of Africa because nomadic people are trying to invade the land of sedentary people who are not being protected by their own governments. As to poor governments, Dr. Kamara, when was the last time that any of your institutions, like the um, African Development Bank, told a government, listen, mate, you're doing the wrong thing? When was the last time? They cannot. They cannot. <laughs> ah, they can't do it exactly. And this is where it suits the West, right? And again, I think you made the point. It suits the West to support governments that do not agree, or elites that will not really implement change. A, a, an economist much more famous than me, called Joe Stiglitz, and again, I'm sure some of you will have read his books, when he talks about globalization and its discontent, he says very clearly, if the governments of Africa had wanted to implement land reform, they would have alienated their own elites and they would have lost power. When you have at your next meeting uh, Mohammed Amin, you ask him that. Which government has actually done that? Uh, one last point, if I may, Madam Chairman, and is this. African countries are being encouraged by the EU, by the World Bank, for which you have worked a long time. I didn't last very long. I get kicked out of most institutions I work for. Are encouraging more commodities. Now here, overwhelmingly, again, we are economists. You know about the terms of trade. You know that the, the prebish uh, uh, axiom that, tr that the terms of trade are biased against primary producers. But what does the EU does? It puts in Tanzania a bloke who is encouraging and subsidizing more coffee. Now, the other half of my family is from Ethiopia. And you know, the, com the coffee farmers, when we go back, we know they are producing more coffee. What is the export? Uh, 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 who is the export benefiting? The foreign currency will help buy more four by fours for the elites in the cities. It will encourage um, possibly bathtubs and, and, uh, and, and luxuries that the poorest cannot have. But we have got to have a system in which commodities are either processed within Africa, and I agree with all of those who say, people who have said that, process commodities before they're exported, which the European Union will not accept now. So we are back to land, and we have got to find ways of enabling the woman farmer, who again, as Mr. Kamara has said, tends to be 
the farmer, and I had seen her when he was with Agra in his previous uh, uh, job, worked out and statistically proven, again, as a bit, I'm a bit skeptical about statistics, that the average farmer in Africa is an older woman. Now, what do we do about training the next generation of farmers? If we don't, we are basically condemning Africa to be more and more food dependent. And again, someone said a few minutes ago, how convenient for the West. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bring, you want to make any comments? I, I have, um, you, you have put a question. There. But let me just add to what uh, Dr. Dembit said about the, the Bengal family, uh, famine in 1943. You know that recently it has been discovered that Winston Churchill gave orders to divert a ship coming with wheat from Australia that was going to India and he diverted it to serve, I think it was for the war effort in, in, in Europe or something. So this is, this is it just goes to, to show that policies are important and not only policies directly related, even policies that are remote from, from the same, same, same subject. Uh, I also have a comment on the question of registering land. Registering land individually? Individual ownership? This is very important. It doesn't matter. Uh, exactly. So, but I think this is quite important. Because, because you, in, you, you register individually, you're reproducing this system, and you're reproducing disparities when in Africa, collective ownership of land is the norm more than individual ownership. So I think we should go a step further when addressing the question. Now, your, your question. Libya. Of course, Libya, you know, there's a power vacuum. There's no state in Libya. And of course, uh, uh, when there is no, uh, when there is no state, uh, people benefit from it. And by the way, in Libya, migrants who go to Libya do not come from Africa from different regions in Africa. They even come from Bangladesh. They even come from other regions, from other, from other continents. And when, when the EU was successful, between inverted commas, in making deals with uh, warlords in, 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 in Libya, you know, the route from Morocco has been used by, 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 by migrants and the numbers have grown up in, uh, from, from Morocco. So in fact, you will not be able to address the question of population movement uh, through uh, migration policies alone. The question is much, much uh, more important and more significant than that, and you need to address it through political measures, but you need to address it through economic policies, uh, policies also. The, the, the Turkey deal, the, the Turkey deal, of course, uh, the Turkey deal has reduced uh, tremendously the, uh, the, the numbers, the flows that go uh, from, from Turkey, in fact, uh, um, to, to the Balkans or to Greece, uh, to Greece. Yes, but then, but then uh, the, 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 the problem has remained in Lebanon. It has remained in Jordan. So what do we draw as lesson? Do we need to encourage uh, deals such as the Turkey deal? The Turkey deal, in fact, even the EU does not dare submit it to the European Parliament. Because if it goes to the European Parliament, it is not constitutional in accordance to the European, uh, European uh, uh, Lisbon, uh, Lisbon Treaty. So I don't think really that uh, the, the Turkey deal is something that uh, Europe can be very proud of. Uh, on the contrary, I think many Europeans have denounced uh, such, uh, such a deal. Thank you. Uh, Sir Kamara, you want to make a point? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so on the issue about uh, the, uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and what, what has been the role of the bank in setting the preconditions, I think that is an important question. Uh, I would like to say that uh, 
you know, I think we, we, we as an institution had, you know, gone ahead, you know, uh, ahead of uh, the, Afri the African Union. In the sense that, uh, you know, when we uh, crafted our strategy, the 10 year strategy, one of the pillars is, uh, is regional integration. And we have been working with uh, our re regional member countries in you know, strengthening regional integration. And that is, you know, how can we strengthen the regional economic blocks? So we have been working with uh, the SADC, with uh, the West Africa uh, uh, Monetary Union, the, 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 the MRUs, and then also the, uh, the East Africa uh, regional uh, blocks. In addition to that, we have also been working on strengthening the infrastructure because you, you mentioned that uh, for free trade to work, we need the infrastructure, the road, the power connections, you see, and also even the, the non-tariff barriers. So we, ha we have to work with our regional member countries to ensure that they put in the right policies to eliminate you know, some of those non-tariff barriers. And uh, we've, we, we've um, really made progress in terms of uh, interconnection amongst uh, African countries. Uh, then, uh, well, Professor, and then also on the, the, the issue about uh, can we encourage countries to sign up to the free trade agreement when they don't have the preconditions yet? I think yes, but at the same time, we talk about terms of trade terms. We have to make them favorable to African countries. And as you look at the structure of African countries, like you mentioned, you have weak states, you have poor states, you have the big players. But then if you allow individual countries to bargain with EU, with China, they don't have the muscle, they don't have the political muscle, they don't have the economic muscle. For instance, if you leave Sierra Leone alone, poor country, to go and negotiate with China, they can't come up with good terms of trade. So that's why we need this uh, continental free trade agreement. So that when we go and negotiate, we can go as a block. As a block. So I think the, yes, we should encourage African countries to sign on to that agreement. Um, I think, let me stop here because there's so many points I've been Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Uh, Con uh, contributors, I mean, we, were we said we we're going to get into a wrestling match. I think we're all winners here, okay? And it's been extremely interesting. Be before we end, I want to tell you uh, two things for the audience, really. We have a big interest in Africa uh, at ECS, not because Egypt is leading the African Union, but because we need to address Africa. Africa is, is still a virgin continent that's being terribly exploited at this point by China. And it's a shame that we are part of Africa. The north of Africa should be the natural market and the integration of Africa is, is a must. Okay, so we are paying attention to this. So along those lines, we have something big happening on the 20th of October on Africa in collaboration. African Development Bank is also helping us. There is something called the Mo Foundation, which is uh, Mo Ibrahim Foundation. This is originally Sudanese businessman who established this foundation to support Africa. Uh, and they created a governance index, measuring the governance index for all the countries. And we are going to have the index presented in Cairo for all of Africa for the benefit of all. Anybody who does business with Africa need to understand this. A clear understanding of what the development agenda is is a must. The very next day we have another meeting, but it's a, it's a closed one, with a number of international think tanks comparing their agendas for Africa. Because I'm sure, and this African Development Bank is collaborating with us closely. The agendas for development are uh, involve a lot of overlap, and there are things that are missed, and they are key things. Okay, nobody knows who's doing what. So we're going to have this meeting to compare notes. And, and between ECS and African Development Bank, we're going to have a, an indicator of some kind to monitor the progress of the research agenda and monitor its, uh, its, uh, its implementation. So, so in October, there's something big about Africa. This month, there are two things. On the 11th, we are having uh, a, a big thing also on the uh, handicrafts industry in Egypt. It's an industry that has an incredible potential of benefiting the poor, benefiting the, the families, benefiting women in particular, because lots of activities are happening in houses and so on. It's not picking up. 
it's not picking up. We're always talking about it as always, but it's water, water everywhere, but not a single drop to drink. Okay, so we are going to have a big conference with a focus attention on it to see where the problems are. And the problem is in the government more than anybody else, let me say in advance, but we're going to talk about it in details. On the 25th of this month, we're going to have here a meeting on the social justice. We are going to analyze very deeply, very deeply, the survey that just came out on the income and the expenditure. And uh, the, the, the media, the talk is only looking at the fact that 32% of the Egyptian people are uh, under the poverty line, but there's a lot more to it than that, okay? The structure of the 32%, what's happening, the trends, we're going to have a very deep uh, uh, analysis here. One last point that I forgot, I should have put it in the, the beginning related to what you were talking about, about the states not implementing change. There was a, um, a very famous, very nice actually, World Bank study a number of years ago that was talking about the conditions for success of reform. And a key condition is the political desirability. If the reform is not desirable in the sense that it does not add to the, to the power of the, there are two levels of desirability. One, he's very power, it, it will add to his um, um, base of supporters, so he will go for it. Or he's doing it, because if he doesn't, he will be thrown out. So he does it, you know, <laughs> so that the desirability can come at the two extremes, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and, and when you look at the countries and assess, it's actually more or less always rotating around us. Thank you very much, uh, and, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the rest of our events. We're going to start the marathon. Thank you. Thank you.